Okay. So I'll start just with Sten's introductory slide. So Sten chaired this session just to summarize some of the points that Sten made and then go over some of the uh, discussions that we had. And then right at the end, I am going to get Richard to come up just to talk a little bit about the progress on the common coordinate framework from the point of view of the NIH. So Sten, um, understandably, is very pro the brain. It's leading the HCA. And it's very true that it is incredibly intensively studied um, both by single cell RNA-seq and spatial methods. So far, the work's really been done in mouse, but, but human is developing. We're making more and more human data on this. It's also incredibly well-funded by sort of atlasing projects through the NIH Brain Initiative and um, uh, other national funding methods. Something else that is important to say is that when we say brain, I think we really mean the whole nervous system, or we should mean the whole nervous system, um, but perhaps brain is a handy uh, shorthand for that. It's also providing all of the challenges of the full-scale atlas. It's a technically difficult tissue um, it's got many cell types for interpretation and annotation, and of course there are the social challenges of growing the community, acquiring the tissues and growing the community and working together towards the common goal. Sten showed this table from a recent review just talking about all of the single cell RNA-seq data sets that have been produced for the brain. Um, it's a very extensive list, um, most of them being mouse, but there are some human scattered in here, and one could also start to make a similar table for a spatially resolved methods. So, the brain really does have a lot of data behind it already in the mouse, which is incredibly exciting. Um, the Brain Initiative is funding all of these projects. Um, these two from Arnold and Ed being very relevant, and also others So in, in the marmoset. So there are some NHP works and non-human primate atlases going on as well. So just, just to emphasize that the brain is being incredibly well studied. And so discussion points that we had, we talked about existing projects uh, between Ed and Sten are trying to map uh, major regions around 100 of the adult brain, both cortical and subcortical, um, with the aim, this is, a, this is a big pilot project of understanding biology and testing methods. Uh, one finding that they found is that some regions of the brain are more amenable to dissociation and single cell RNA-seq or single nuclear RNA-seq than others. Um, and I think this, this project will produce a load of really cool data and just understanding of how to do these sorts of projects as well. Um, Arnold Kriestein's lab is looking more at development at the developing human brain, doing whole cell methods, single cell RNA-seq in the first and second trimester, but then beyond that into the third trimester and into um, early postnatal and, and into uh, pediatric samples using nuclear methods because these are from frozen banked samples, uh, sort of retrospectively. Um, they're also incorporating physiology, so asking, well, if we can look at the response to agonists of these brain cells, how does that map? How do we integrate that with our transcriptomic data? What does adding a layer of physiological information tell them? Um, and also looking at epigenomics with a single cell ATAC seq. We also had a discussion about the importance of understanding the effects of things like post mortem interval on the data. And this isn't unique to the brain, of course. We've talked about this before in this meeting and in other meetings that knowing what your artifacts are, knowing what um, happened to your samples before you analyze them is crucial, and, and recording those metadata is really important. So. We also discussed the possibility of something that I didn't know happened, but um, there are certain operations where an entire hemisphere of the brain is removed uh, from living donors, and, and that provides material from living donors for analysis, which I, I think is kind of incredible. Um, and Ed made the point that their observation seems to be that RNA quality seems more important for single cell analysis versus bulk. Um, so again, this understanding the effects of post-mortem interval and, and sample uh, preparation is crucial. And of course, as our consent and ethics, and um, we'll have the consent and ethics breakout session discussed next, but this idea of making data fully openly accessible and not accessible under managed access is, is pretty new. It's something that's being pushed by initiatives such as the HCA and, and the Brain Initiative. But uh, retrospective samples that are frozen are typically not consented like that. So even though it's possible to change consents to be fully open access, older samples can't be used in that framework. And, and we discussed trying to strike the balance between being able to maximize the samples we have, particularly rare samples from particular diseases, but making the data as open and useful as possible. And there's a tension there within the HCA that, that is obviously important, and trying to work out the best way to navigate that is crucial, but I suspect that will be discussed in the next session. We also talked about how do we bridge between various initiatives that all essentially have similar goals and are working towards understanding the same system. So how, how do we most efficiently bridge between things like the Brain Initiative and the HCA? How do we maximize efficiency, minimize duplication? I don't think we, we had any major new insights here other than it would be, it's a really good thing to do. We need to work out how best to 
um, collect data, how best to work together on, on all of these things so that we, we just maximize the science. And then we talked about future challenges. So the HCA is a platform that will contain healthy data, of course, as its, as its main product. But we wanted to support the study of disease. So how best do we do that? How do we build our platform so that it enables people to do things such as project their cells into it and to understand what's going on from their own samples, possibly from disease? And what samples do we prioritize? Do we just do adults? Do we include um, developmental samples? And, and STEM had this nice rule of thumb that about a third of all neurological diseases have a developmental origin, so we should definitely include developmental samples. And maybe a third are also involved in processes such as aging, so we should try and study the whole lifespan um, of the human. And I, I totally support that. I think that's, that's a very good way of thinking about this. And then we had a, a, a longer discussion on something that STEM brought up in the morning session and the question is about this idea of annotation. So you can generate data pretty quickly. You can generate clusters pretty quickly. But how do you then produce knowledge from those clusters? How do you annotate those clusters as being particular cell types? And that's the thing that takes the time. And at the moment, I think what we're all doing is we're getting ourselves, our, our lab members, to sit down, look at the clusters, use what we know, use our domain knowledge to, to annotate those clusters. But of course, that doesn't scale and isn't systematic in a way that works for these, these large efforts. So it would be fantastic to develop collaborative, iterative, and, and a common repository of, to, to annotate cell clusters, collect, collecting all known knowledge about cell type markers and enabling us to apply that kind of automatically to our data. This would be incredibly valuable, and Stem made the point this may be one of the most valuable outcomes of the HCA is this collection of this knowledge about cell types. And then in neurons, of course, transcriptome is incredibly... It, it, the transcriptome and the morphology. Morphology is really important with neurons, so how do these things map? We should try and understand that as well, and that goes back to some of the spatial stuff that was talked about before and imaging things. Um, so just moving on to the common coordinate framework, which in terms of this idea of understanding having a mathematical representation of an organ in space, the, the brain is probably the, the best understood of this, so it's particularly the mouse brain. And we talked about that there are histological reference atlases based on slices through a brain, and there are also probabilistic three-dimensional atlases, and also capturing the local architecture. Each specific specimen um, is important. And this is important because cell types, if we're thinking about uh, things on the, uh, the resolution of cell types, they exist within local probabilistic environments rather than in gross anatomical regions. This is a, a local, not a global problem, as, as Ed talked about with us. And so we need to think about all of these different scales to try and put these CCFs together. They're almost certainly going to be organ-specific. I may well not be able to map one across every organ that's generalizable. And as Aviv said earlier this morning, these are likely to become iteratively generated um, along with the data. And molecular information will make it easy to align spatial and anatomical data. And we should be able to integrate anatomies and ontologies. And so on that point, I'll just ask Richard to come up for a few minutes. So there was a workshop in, um, at NIH in Bethesda uh, last year in December. Where some, people, where some of us got together and we talked about ways we might go towards making a common coordinate framework, um, which Richard kindly hosted, and he will just give us a little bit of an update on where we are with that. Great. Thanks, Mike. And I'd just like to also say thank you for organizing this meeting. It's been very interesting to hear all the discussions. And uh, the unavoidable meeting that I was in was a bunch of different funders getting together. And as you can imagine, that meeting ran completely over time, and we didn't decide anything, but we had a lot of fun discussing various issues. <laughs> so like any good government meeting, it's, it wasn't we didn't reach any conclusions, but we, we managed to get to at least a good understanding. So in terms of the meeting that Mike mentioned, we had this meeting back in mid-December. Um, we just got the summary report last week, so we are certainly going to post it on the NIH Common Fund side as part of the HubMap program, and we'll share it with the folks at the Human Cell Atlas, and I think we'll find somewhere to put it on the website as well through HCA. So th this was an effort uh, joined between NIH, the Human Cell Atlas, and uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And it was really bringing together a bunch of people to discuss this idea of what a common coordinate framework meeting, a common coordinate framework would look like for the human body. Um, you know, with the thinking that this should be this should uniquely and reproducibly define any location in the human body. It should obviously be robust against different developmental stages, as well as different diseases and conditions. <coughs> So the, the discussion really focused on three different areas. So one was um, integrating existing knowledge and tools, uh, as well as thinking about how we need to refine those based on um, developing these cell-level 
um, understanding of what's going on in the human body. And then the second being key features and associated challenges to making a durable common coordinate framework. Again, recognizing that it's going to evolve over time as we bring in different systems and different types of information, we need to be able to integrate that as we go along. And again, also to, to, that it's tolerant for human variability, uh, functional differences, again, across the lifespan and different diseases. And then the third area was to think about some potential pilots to, to build and test a common coordinate set framework. So, you know, I liked the comment earlier about the analogy with uh, the universal common coordinate framework. You know, I think all my colleagues at NASA would point out that they have many other different problems to deal with. You know, for example, they have many different time scales, a much broader range, many different spatial scales. They have many different frames of reference they have to deal with. And you know, one of the interesting points that they often bring up is they also had to deal with a large an amateur astronomy community. Which again was, you know, bearing in mind you've got space-based telescopes, you've also got um, a, a large amateur community they wanted to be able to submit data to. So, you know, it's not necessarily unlike this, but, you know, that was actually one of the biggest challenges because, you know, certainly in the funding side we can think about how we motivate the people we give awards to, but then there's also this much broader community that... Uh, there's no direct influence with, but clearly they want to be involved. Everyone's enthusiastic about this idea of sharing data and understanding it. So, you know, I think there are there are also many other lessons, I think, to learn from that two-decade process that the astronomy community went through. And, you know, in particular, also engaging the professional societies in that discussion, because, you know, again, that was a, a critical part to this. They needed to bring along a whole variety of different communities at a professional level to, to get them engaged in the process. So in terms of other things that were discussed at this, there was a lot of discussion about existing knowledge and tools. Uh, you know, I like the, the comment about anatomy. You know, I think, again, it's worth uh, mentioning that the anatomists, there's no universal opinion to what an anatomical atlas looks like. You know, in the meeting it was brought up that there's uh, at least five different varieties of anatomical approaches. There's regional, systemic, clinical, developmental, surface, radiological, and microanatomical. But, you know, I think the key point is, again, you know, quite often, if we're thinking about communities, we think they quite often have a unified way of approaching this. But then once you start delving into that community, you realize even there there's not consistency in how they approach these problems. And again, you know, quite often it's driven by what are those use cases at the end of the day that they want that information for and why they want to share it. Um, so we also at the meeting had a, a discussion about reference atlases and what those mean. Um, Essentially, what what are the end use cases for a common coordinate framework system? Obviously, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the brain. You know, I would mention there again many different programs have struggled this with this in different ways. We also have another common fund program at the NIH that uh, is thinking about this in terms of the peripheral nervous system. So they have they're reasonably far down the route of developing a common coordinate framework system, at least for their particular program. And again, I think there's the opportunity to, to have discussions with many of these other efforts who are struggling with very much the same issue that certainly aren't, aren't an active part of this conversation so far. So uh, in terms of key considerations for building a CCF, uh, the meeting in December, there were five different areas that were brought up. One was thinking about uh, in terms of defining a common coordinate framework system, what do we need to also do in terms of tissue and specimen collection and processing? How do we preserve relevant spatial information uh, at that early collection stage? Um, again, you can see in the paper that there were a number of suggestions for how that might be approached. But really, I think the feeling was that there needed to be a pilot to see how practical this is to do in, under different scenarios, and then obviously to iterate that process, process as we go along because clearly we're not going to get it right the first time. There also needed to be um, quality control or proper validation of the uh, location of tissue specimens, and there was quite a lot of discussion about that. And I think the word of the conference was anatogram. Anyone, anyone know what anatogram is? So it's basically the, the discussion that, and you know, the, probably the best example is in the, uh, in the world of flowers, whenever they're drawing a flower and you want to be able to identify a flower, it's, instead of taking a picture, it's much easier just to draw a picture because then you can accentuate the features that you want to uh, use to identify that flower in the future. 
so this was brought up in terms of reference to the anatomy, because again, if you want to reference where a particular specimen came from, you know, quite often you might not want to take a picture, because that may not always be the most illustrative, that perhaps you also want to have some kind of drawing, or alternatively some kind of drawing, to uh, show where that tissue is collected and relevant to uh, certain anatomical landmarks. Uh, and obviously, another part to all of this is developing a common language that underlies all of this, that again, given the specialities in each individual organ or disease or condition, they quite often have their own unique ontologies, uh, ways of describing things. And you know, certainly even, well, you know, I pick on the radiologists here, you know, if you go for a radiology exam in one part of the country, the, the way in which they describe that exam may be the same as somebody else, but in terms of the actual imaging set, it's going to end up being quite different because it all depends on how that person was trained to do that exam. So they may call it the same thing, but the underlying data sets might be quite different. So all of that led to a discussion of next steps. Uh, there was, again, if you read the report, you can see there were a number of suggestions for potential target tissues for thinking about some kind of pilot, uh, different next steps for how to tie together both what may be common coordinate frameworks for different regions of the body, you know, for example, what's going on in the brain, how do we tie that together, for example, what's going on is, uh, in the kidney, and then, so, you know, that's one level of challenge, what we do, to how we approach each individual organ, and then, obviously, how we approach it body-wide is, is a separate question, and, again, the, the people who participated in the workshop had a number of ideas there. Uh, so th that's basically a quick summary. In terms of next steps, you know, I mentioned there was a couple of suggestions for pilot projects. Obviously, as part of different programs, um, they're developing these common coordinate framework systems. You heard about the brain. I mentioned Spark. We're, we'll be doing this as part of the HubMap program as well. So you know, I think there, there'll be several pilot, pro pilot efforts and different programs, and obviously we're very interested in coordinating these uh, both within NIH as well as obviously transnationally with different uh, groups, including HCA as well. So uh, that's it. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Thanks, Richard. We've got time for a couple of comments or questions. Can you just clarify when you mean uh, regarding the anatomy, the, the the net separate of I don't know if you meant with the net separation with the gross gross anatomy and the anatomy uh, more related to the cells. Uh, I think we can't completely dissociate the two things because the, the, even the, the the function of a group of cells in a small local place need to make sense with the big one. So I think the long term uh, should be keeping in mind the whole organ and then eventually the whole, the whole body. So I'm, I'm not sure what exactly you meant there. So sorry if I inferred that the two were dissociated from each other. You know, I think the thinking is definitely, it's, it requires a multi-scale approach. So yes, I mean, it clearly needs to be tied to the underlying anatomy, but how exactly you position um, cells or clusters of cells or micro environments or neighborhoods or you know however you wish to describe it and whatever skill you know I think that that's where the complexity of this comes in because clearly we have good non-specific anatomical models of the human body and you know I think as much as possible I think we're all interested in reusing those but the question is once you get down to the molecular specific level how do you match that information against that uh, larger scale, non-specific information. And I think, you know, there's different ways and a couple of people have mentioned different ways of doing this. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, not in the Im immediate, but it's a, in a long term, uh, the technologies will evolve and will eventually be able to uh, pull everything together and make sense. But, I, yeah. Great, thank you very much. I think 